Well, good morning, folks. Um, thank you, John, for that ludicrously generous introduction. Um, and it works. Um, I, I am very pleased to be here. I, I, very pleased indeed. I, I was an engineering undergraduate here from 1964 to 1968, which, if you have a calculator to hand, will tell you that I'm extremely elderly. Um, I really enjoyed my time in UCC. Um, I was the first member of my family to go to university. Um, and my mother, to her dying day, thought it was a mistake because I came away with lots of ideas above my station. That was her view. Um, but it was a wonderful experience, and, and it is for me very nice to be an adjunct professor here, to have worked with, um, with John and Tom uh, on, on various things, and to be able to ha have the excuse to come back from time to time. Uh, so that's, I'm really pleased to be here. I'm particularly pleased to be here also because of the day that's in it. Um, this event is, in a way, a celebration or a marking of um, the fact that many people here have been on personal journeys. Um, and I've been on a journey too, so I know what it's like. Because, um, as you will know, the, the internet, for example, is now a very old technology. Uh, it dates from, from the early 1960s in its, in its original form, in its, as it were, its prehistory dates from the 1960s. Uh, the network that we use today, the one based on the TCP IP family of protocols, was switched on in January the 1st, 1983. Um, so it's, been, it's, it's an old technology, and for m much of that time, I have been, in one way or another, involved with it and using it. Um, and I'm very proud of the fact that the, the network is, in fact, a creation of my generation. This is a baby boomer project, um, and the two designers of the net uh, of the internet, as we have it now, Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn, are exactly the same age as I am. Uh, and sometimes when we meet, um, we kind of uh, exchange stories about our great-grandchildren. It's kind of terrible, but there you go. Um, so th that's where I'm coming from. Um, now, as I said, I have been on a, I've been on a journey too. Um, and I started off, I guess, as a techno-utopian. Um, and over the years, I've slowly got smarter, I think, uh, and you could now describe me as a recovering utopian. So some of the things I want to say to you this morning uh, are colored by that personal journey that, that, that I've been on. And trying to think of a title for, for, for this, I, I, I came up with information technology for grown-ups. And you might wonder what I mean by that. Well, it's very simple, really. Um, I think that uh, our societies have essentially checked out their brains at the door when they start to talk about information technology. Um, it's almost as if people somehow have had surgically removed their common sense and their judgment and their, their own sense of humanity when they address this stuff. Um, and I think there's no reason for that. I think it's a great mistake and I think it's time, as it were, uh, we fought back and I'm going to try and explain why that is. Um, just to show you that I'm an authorized teacher, I have a plan. You don't have to pay any attention to it. Um, I'm going to start from the position that perhaps some of you started from when you were embarking on, this, on, on the challenges, um, which is that for many people, um, technology this technology, information technology, or ICT, is, is definitely personally challenging. But actually, that's a very old story. And I was going to play you um, a YouTube video made by AT&T, the American telephone monopoly, a long time ago, on how to use the dial telephone. For various technical reasons, it's not worth um, playing here because I haven't got an audio link that works. But I recommend that you just Google it and have a look yourself. It's a hoot. Uh, because believe it or not, AT&T uh, had to explain to people how you use the dial telephone. Right? And, and every so often I see, nowadays, I see people saying, well, this is how you use an iPhone. Uh, and the person says, where's the keyboard? And they say, well, it, it's a virtual keyboard, you know, and so on. You get this kind of stuff all the time. This has been going on for as long as there's been technology, I think. Um, and let's not worry about it. it, it but we need to put this in a kind of a, in a context. 
because it still is perceived as being challenging. Um, so I think the beginnings of wisdom are uh, something that a guy called Melvin Kranzberg came up with a while back, the laws of technology. Uh, again, you can, if you Google him or you go to Wikipedia, you'll find them. Kranzberg's first law says that technology is neither good nor bad, but it isn't neutral either. Okay, and that's absolutely critical. It's critical for two reasons. One of them is that when I look at the public discourse about, about ICT in our societies, I hear a kind of absurd debate between people who are fanatically in favor of it and regard people who are not as being somehow deficient and people who are worried about it, fearful of it, and so on, and think it is the work of the devil. And if you look at the kind of public discourse, what you find is this Manichaean debate between light and dark. And I think that's idiotic. We are, we are in a way, like, we're like two drunks in a pub arguing about whether or not, on balance, oxygen is a good thing. Okay. Um, so my, my feeling about the implications of the, of the first law, of Kranzberg's first law, it has a number of important implications, and I think they're good for us in terms of mental hygiene. The first is that I think, and I really mean this, we need to change the way we talk and think about ICT. We need to stop being intimidated by it. Uh, nobody in this room is intimidated by the fact that they haven't the faintest idea how an internal combustion engine works. Nobody. You all, many of you drove here. You use an internal combustion engine all the time. You, you don't have any idea how it works. You're not even b bothered by the fact that you, we drive ourselves around using a series of controlled explosions all the time, okay? None of that matters, okay? We're not intimidated by, by except if we're deficient um, human beings like, say, um, uh, the, the, the top gear a lot. Um, we're not kind of intimidated or oppressed by this technology in a big way, okay? We just, it's just something there. But when anything involving computing or the network or, 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 or apps or anything like that happens, then we suddenly, for some reason, lose this sense of our own confidence. Uh, and we become kind of, I don't know, cowards or something. I see this all the time. So we've got to stop that. There's no need for it, and we have to stop it. We have to resist something that's almost like an occupational disease in some parts of the world now. Um, Neil Postman, the great cultural critic, called it technopoly, the worship of technology. Um, you have it in its most extreme form in a part of the world called Silicon Valley, uh, which is full of, which is a kind of reality distortion field. Um, the folks in Silicon Valley, uh, they really think that they're the center of the universe. But not only that, they think also that Palo Alto, which is the heart of this thing, is kind of like the Florence of, Rev of Renaissance 2.0. It's utter nonsense. Um, but for some reason, our world has become so hypnotized by, by this technology and by the people who now control and dominate it that we are actually also subscribing passively to this nonsense as well. There's no need for it, and we shouldn't. So we have to keep our critical faculties in good working order. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that soon. And we have to accept something. What we have to accept is that, going back to Kranzberg's first thing, which is that technology is, is as were, I would say, both good and bad. This technology is both wonderfully empowering, no question about it, it's absolutely wonderful stuff in terms of augmenting human capabilities, uh, in terms of helping us do things that we couldn't do before, in terms of enabling us to communicate with people we couldn't communicate with before, wonderful stuff. And it is also alarmingly dangerous in what it's doing to us. And it's both at the same time. So a grown-up discussion about this stuff starts from there. A good first principle is to stop talking about offline and online. There, there is no offline world anymore. Once upon a time, there was. For example, in the 1980s, when the internet first, was first developed and, and it was a playground for geeks like me, um, there were two parallel universes. One was called cyberspace, and that was the space, the, the, the virtual space, in which the researchers who worked uh, on, the, uh, on the early uh, internet 
uh, during the research phase from 73 to 83, and then the first uh, decade after 83. Um, it was a completely different place from, from what John Perry Barlow, the great lyricist of The Grateful Dead, calls meat space. In other words, the space where reed people lived. Um, and, and, and those two parallel universes existed side by side, and they had almost nothing to do with one another. And that was true until about 1993. And then in 1993, something happened. Uh, a, a kid called Mark Andreessen and a programmer called Eric Biener, they released the first thing we would recognize as a real web browser. It was called Mosaic. And from that moment onwards, the ordinary world, the world of meat space, finally sussed what this internet thing was all about because nobody had any idea in the 80s what it was about. But suddenly they thought, oh, hey, this could be, this is interesting, this could be used. This could be used for business. This could be used for pornography. This could be used for all kinds of other stuff. And so what happened is that those two parallel universes merged. And they merged to create the world that we now inhabit. And it's a very confusing world because it combines two aspects of universes that were originally parallel. Um, so we have, we, we have this world in which uh, it no longer makes any sense at all to talk about the offline world and the online world. Um, the internet is part of everybody's life. The technology is part of everyone's life. Um, there will be soon five billion users of the internet. Okay, out of a planet with a population of seven billion, right? Okay, there's no point in talking about this stuff as if just something else removed from our everyday life. And of course, you know that yourselves in your own, in your own um, experience. Uh, is there anybody here today who has not used the internet this morning? Okay, I rest my case. This is the world we now inhabit. So, in you thinking about teaching and learning, that's where you start from. Now, you wouldn't have started from there 15 years ago or 20 years ago, but you do now. What does that mean? Well, an interesting case in point is um, the, the, the arguments that go on among educators about social networking, and in particular about Facebook. Um, for example, uh, university teachers uh, who are bothered by the fact that they discover that the students in their, in their MA class um, are not only discussing the course in, their, in a Facebook group, but actually swapping ideas for answers to the exam questions. Okay? And there's a shock horror, like, like, um, like Victorian maiden aunts uh, shocked by uh, a, a naked butler, um, that students are doing this kind of stuff, and, 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 and what are we going to do, and so on and so forth. Um, the truth of the matter is that uh, whether you like it or not, uh, the universe that you have to live in as, a, as, a, as an educator now includes uh, social networking, and it includes, among other things, the most powerful, one of the most powerful agencies we have ever seen as human beings. It's called Facebook. Uh, Facebook, as I talk today, has 1.65 billion users. If it were a country, it would have a seat in the Security Council of the United Nations. It has more people now than China. Okay. And half of those people use this site every day. Okay. There is simply no ignoring this um, for all kinds of reasons. Um, but, but one of them is, that is, is the colossal power it now has over, over our, our existence. And the interesting thing about it is that um, it not only has power over us, but we are willing accomplices in giving it that power. Okay, Facebook provides us with quotes free, unquote, services that we really value. How many people here have Facebook accounts? Right. How many people here have children who have Facebook accounts? Is there anybody here who doesn't have a Facebook account? Right, well, congratulations. Your time will come. Um, but, but the point I'm trying to get at is that, um, if, for example, if, if you're running, uh, as I, I teach master's students in Cambridge, if, if, you're, if you're running anything in the educational world now, one of the things you should take on board is that this is where your, your students are going to be, and this is, in one way or another, where you should be as an educator. Okay. It's not rocket science, but, but on the other hand, it goes against the, educator, the educator's grain. We don't want to have anything to do with this stuff, really. 
Uh, well, whether you do or not, I think you're stuck with it. And the problem, of course, is that Facebook is not a charity. Facebook is a huge capitalist business. Uh, and what it, what it makes its money from is you and me. Um, it's, it, you, a better way to think of it would be like we used to think about the oil companies. These are companies that extract oil from the ground and they process it and refine it and sell it. Well, what Facebook does is it also extracts non-natural resources and they're the data that you create, every, we create every time we use their service and then they sell the, 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 the digital trails uh, to, to folks we have never heard of using auction systems that we can't even dream of and so on. So you've got to, you've got to be real about this. This is, um, th this is something that's both sinister and very powerful and also very useful. Um, so the first, having, 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 having recognized that we need, to, uh, we need to address the world as it is, and Facebook is a really important part of the world as it is, we also need to have a second kind of conversation which we tend to avoid, which is we need to understand what the technology is doing to them, to our students, and to us. And that's a conversation that really needs to be developed. Now you hear it, of course, uh, in all kinds of ways. You hear it in family conversations in, uh, for, from people who worry about children and, and this technology. Um, and there's a vague sense of unease. The kids are always using it. Uh, actually, it's not just the kids. Um, everybody's using it. Um, and, and the idea that this is not having serious impact on us is nonsensical. This is having really serious impacts on every aspect of our beings. Uh, and you don't ha it's not a technophobic argument, it's a realist argument. That's the point. Because people who don't like the technology always say that this is happening, and those of us who use it uh, and like it and feel comfortable with it and the rest would think, well, that's just because they can't stand the technology. No. The only realistic grown-up attitude to this technology is to say it, it has all these wonderful affordances, and it has some really scary ones. And the scary ones are, are not just surveillance and, and the things that, that, that we know about. They're also the fact, for example, that, uh, we, that, that the, the dominant technologies, communications technologies that people use change the structure of your brains. Uh, reading, reading changes the structure of the human brain because it's a very plastic organ. That's why the brains of, of people who are illiterate are different in structure from the brains of people who are. And it's inconceivable that the same thing hasn't happened with this technology now. But that's, a, that's almost a relatively minor thing. The more important things are things like suddenly um, the, the, the erosion of faith in anything connected with face-to-face -face conversation. Um, and you see that in all kinds of ways, for example, in the way in which um, people will, families now, uh, will choose to use text or email as a way of having arguments rather than having them face to face. There's a flight from, from person to person communication which is engendered by this technology. And that's real, uh, it's very worrying, um, and I think it's, it's getting worse. Um, and we need to have that as part of the conversation, not as a conversation between technological enthusiasts and technophobes, but in terms of grown-ups sitting down and saying, okay, we have something serious here. There's a really good book which I recommend, Sherry Turkle's book, uh, she's been, this is, a, this is a furrow she's been plowing for a long time, but she, her new book is a very interesting one about that. Um, and she, she, there's a lot of interesting psychological um, uh, evidence now for this. For, for example, a famous uh, psychological experiment in which American undergraduates were, um, were asked to sit alone and silent uh, for 15 minutes. And they were given the option that if they were getting bored, they could administer electric shocks to themselves. Some of you will know the experiment. Actually, many of them started after six minutes. People have real difficulty in, in, in handling solitude now. Real difficulty. And it's not just university undergraduates in elite American universities. It's everybody. Uh, I've taken to watching people in public a lot. Um, and what you see, for example, if, if people are waiting for a bus, Adults, grown-ups like you and me, what do they do? For two minutes they wait and then the phone comes out. Okay. Everywhere you go, you find people unable to be on their own, uh, but needing to use their phones. 
Okay. And this is, this is all very convenient for the industry because the industry, remember, is an extractive one. It has to have a constant supply of data. And every time you use your phone, you're supplying it. Okay. But, so so we're, we're caught up in something very big and very important and very interesting. Um, and it means a flight from, from things that, we, that make us human. Um, Sherry Turkle gave a lecture last week in, in Cambridge about it, and she was saying that she teaches at MIT, and she has office hours, and she encourages her students to come and see her, and almost none of them do. What they want instead is they want to be able to email her and have an email back. And eventually, being a psychologist, she said, I'm going to investigate this. And what she discovered was that her students, this is an elite university, um, they, they're nervous about coming to see her face to face because if they do, then their ignorance will be exposed. Okay, so they want to edit themselves in such a way that they can be presented properly. And that's what this technology does. Everything that happens on Facebook is not an expression of something real. It is generally a performative act. It's people editing themselves for public consumption. And that's very powerful, and it has really serious impact on the way we, way we behave. So if you want to be grown up about this stuff, that's the kind of thing you have to take on board now. And it's, it's not a shameful thing to, to be critical of the stuff. You have to be able to say it because you're a grown up. She writes at one point, uh, the technology, she says, offers the illusion of companionship without the demands of friendship, without the demands of intimacy. Because face to face, people ask for things that computers never ask for. Real people demand responses to what they're feeling and not just any response. That's why families in the United States now take to email when they want to have a fight or they take now, another thing you have to recognize is that there is no, size, no one size fits any, everybody. And as educators, you will know this already. Every, every one of us is different. If I were to go and look at each of your PCs or, um, or, or uh, um, tablets, and I was to examine the ecosystem of apps that you use, in every case, they'd be different. In every case. And that's because we're an ingenious tool using human beings and we eventually try and adapt this technology to meet our personal needs. And everybody's personal needs appear to be different. It's absolutely fascinating. To, I mean, I do it all the time, asking somebody, can I, see, can I see your laptop? It's like saying to somebody, can I see what's in your handbag? It's very revealing. I, I can tell instantly from the way in which people file stuff on a computer when they started using computers. It's that simple. You, th so this is very intimate as well, and that means if you're an educator, you have to pay attention to that. There is no one-size-fits-all thing for anybody. Um, now, one of the other things I've found in conversing, especially with educators in this business, is that um, they're all making, more or less, not all, but most, most, most institutions um, make the same mistake. Uh, they, <laughs> and the best way of describing it is from this famous interview with the greatest ice hockey player who ever lived, apparently. I don't know anything about ice hockey, but this is, I, I take it, Wayne Gretzky. And somebody asked him once in an interview, why are you so good? And he said, well, because the other guys, they skate to where the puck is. And what I try and do is I try and skate to where the puck is going to be. Right? Most people in the IT using IT for education are skating to where the puck was five years ago. Some good ones are skating to where it was uh, last year. Uh, and very few are skating to where it's going to be, where they think it might be. And that's, that's endemic in the whole institutional setup of, of IT for education uh, at the moment. Then, here's the thing that really bugs me. Uh, I've lost count of the number of people who have said to me with great delight or have passed me a, YouTube, a link to a YouTube video showing a small toddler playing with an iPad. Right, or looking at a mobile phone or whatever, and say, isn't it wonderful? Look how adept these children are at this stuff. And I think, you know what? Your children are not chimpanzees, but you're treating them as if they were. Because what kids, what that celebrates is the fact that we are bringing up generations of children who are adept manipulators of black boxes which are created by technological elites somewhere else for profit. And when I say a black box, I mean, as an engineer, that's something that, whose innards you do not understand. 
and in bringing up our children and celebrating the fact that they are these kind of adept monkeys using this black box stuff, we are doing them a great disservice in the long run. And the reason is that they are going to grow up in a world which is run by computers and computer software. And if they don't understand some important things about this stuff, of which the most important is that computer code is malleable. It's not something magical. It's not something fixed. It is something that's written by human beings and which can be changed and sometimes must be changed. But if you don't understand that, then you, your choices as children growing up in a new world are the, are the one described by Douglas Rushkoff in that book of his, you, you have a choice of program or be programmed. Um, or to put it at a higher level, you wind up in a world uh, described by Frank Pasquale, American lawyer, in, in a really interesting book, The Black Box Society. And the point is that um, all of this stuff is human creation. Software is just, is just a human, it's, th it's thought stuff. You have an idea, you write it down, a computer eventually executes it. But it's not, it can be changed. That idea turns out to be very hard to get across to most people. And yet it's one of the most important ideas I can think of. Um, in Britain, uh, there have been some interesting developments in that area. This, this for example, is a Raspberry Pi. It's a credit card sized computer, which was designed by some of my colleagues in the computer lab in Cambridge, which has currently sold seven million and rising. Okay. And it's a small machine, which is a completely functioning, rather powerful computer. And if you hook up a keyboard to it and you hook up a, a television set to it and the rest of it, you can, and you, can, you can run Linux on it, you can run all kinds of very interesting stuff on it. It's really powerful and it costs uh, 25 pounds. There's a cheaper version for 15. Um, and and so, so it's not that the stuff is fantastically expensive and fantastically distant from you and all the rest of it. It isn't like an iPad. It isn't like an iPhone. It isn't like a Samsung S7. It's something that it, it's, just, it's just a bit of kit. And it can do magical things if you can write the code for it. So the, the point of it is that this stuff is not a black box. And we should never treat it as a black box. We should be aware of it. Now, that's easy to say. It's very hard to get across. Um, I was one of a group of people in, in the UK which, which campaigned to persuade the Secretary of State for Education, who was then Michael Gove, uh, to change the ICT curriculum in British secondary schools. Uh, I don't know what it's like in Ireland, but let me tell you that in the British secondary system, the ICT curriculum was dire utterly dire. Why? Because essentially it was about, it turned out to be, it was about training kids to use Microsoft Office. That's what it was actually. And my kids would come home to me and say, Dad, you won't believe this. And I said, what? Said, we had to do PowerPoint. Or we had to do Excel. Or, and so I, I, like many of my colleagues who were embarked on this campaign, we did quite a lot of public speaking. And I used to go and talk to school governors and public, address public meetings and talk to uh, Parent Teachers Association and the rest of it. And I, I would say, look, what we're doing is we're, 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 um, we're, we're teaching them to use something that's pre-baked by somebody else. And what's really important is they must understand, they must understand that software is not something given, it's something that can be changed and something that must sometimes be changed to meet people's needs. I got nowhere with this. I gave talk after talk after talk, blank stares, nobody had any idea. And then finally dawned on me that maybe the reason was that nobody in my audience has ever written any software, ever. They have no idea what a program is, never seen one, no idea. So the next time I, I gave the talk, I brought along one of my favorite cookery books. And I said at the beginning, anybody here cook? All the hands go up. I said, okay, here's my favorite recipe. And I read out the recipe. And it says 300 mils of double cream. And I would say, you know what? For an elderly gentleman like me, 300 mils of double cream is not a good idea. Okay, so I want to change and put 300 mils of creme fraiche. Now, what would you think of a world in which, if I wanted to do that, I had to write to Nigella Lawson and ask her permission? 
and maybe pay her a fee. Okay? And everybody in the room said, that's nuts. Well, it is nuts. But that's, what, that's, what, that's the world we accept with software. None of you, ev everybody here in this room has cooked. Everybody has used a recipe, right? And you know yourself that if you, haven't got, if you haven't got the shallots, you'll use the onions or whatever. You'll change it all the time. That's what we do. It's what makes us human. But suddenly, when we come to software, to computers and the rest of it, we're no longer humans. We're some kind of tolerant, passive automata, afraid to exercise our, our humanity and our freedom and all the rest of it. Okay. Um, what's the, what's the, the message from that? The message is actually simple. It is that when we talk about this stuff from now on, we need to talk in language and use concepts that people understand. Everybody understands recipes. Nobody understands software. So you talk about recipes, you don't talk about software. Um, I used to get some pushback from parents in these discussions. They would say, yeah, come on, you're a bloody academic. Um, but, you know, our kids are getting useful training here because when they go to work, they'll be using Microsoft Office and so on. So you're complaining that you, about ICT training and you say you want our kids to have ICT education. What's the difference? And eventually I thought of an idea. I said, let's replace ICT with sex. Would you like your kids to have sex training or sex education? End of story. This is the way we need to talk about technology. This is the way we need to think about it. And this is the way in which we ought finally to stop being intimidated by it. Thank you very much.